the health care system isn't what you think it is. Tonight, the gap widens for health care between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in Manitoba. I have to use blankets on the doors, both doors. And uh, if I have to use a blanket in my bedroom... And we meet an elderly woman from Alberta whose house is freezing, yet no one will help her. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. And I'm Melissa Ridgen. Justin Trudeau unveiled the Liberal Party's climate plan in Burnaby, BC today. It promises zero net emissions by 2050, but was short on many details. Trudeau was asked why Indigenous voters should vote for him when they are disillusioned by the purchase of the Trans Mountain Pipeline and the removal of Jody Wilson-Raybould from the Liberal Caucus. Trudeau did not directly respond to the question about Wilson-Raybould and instead touted the benefits of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, how profits from the sale of bitumen to foreign markets could be reinvested in a greener future with possible Indigenous pipeline partners. Uh, we uh, have, are pleased to be working with a large number of Indigenous communities and leaders uh, across Alberta and BC who are interested in becoming partners uh, in the TMX expansion. We recognize that there are strongly held views on both sides of this issue, and we are listening very carefully to people with concerns to minimize those concerns, to demonstrate the kind of partnership and respect that is at the heart of reconciliation. Charges have been laid against a Thunder Bay police officer for an incident last year that was widely shared online. The incident happened in December when paramedics and Thunder Bay police officers responded to a call about a 17-year-old female who had non-life-threatening injuries. The video appears to show the intoxicated youth strapped down to a gurney, ready to be transported to the hospital. In the video, it appears an officer yells at the youth and another slaps her. Under the Police Services Act, the officer has been charged with two counts of unlawful or unnecessary exercise of authority. The officer involved remains on leave. First Nations people in Manitoba are dying at a younger rate than non-Indigenous people. That's according to a new report released this month that shows the health gap between First Nation people and all other Manitobans has widened over the past 15 years. As Brittany Hobson shows us, people navigating the system are calling for a more collaborative approach to change these numbers. For me, there's times where I want to give up, but, you know, again, I want my dad to come home. Vanessa Tate's dad was diagnosed with kidney disease in November 2017. For the past year, the 62-year-old has been living in a Winnipeg hotel so he can receive dialysis treatment. In my father's journey, in his patient journey, I've seen, you know, the in inadequate health care system. Like, for instance, it's uh, primary health care. Um, we don't have a lot of um, um, services there for our First Nation communities. The family is from Opipinopoin Cree Nation in northern Manitoba. A new report released this month determined the health gap between First Nation people and all other Manitobans has widened over the past 15 years. It's a joint study by the First Nations Health and Social Secretariat of Manitoba and the Manitoba Centre for Health Policy. Tate says the health care system is set up to fail First Nation people. So when your father tells you, you know, I just want to die because, you know, I miss home, I want to go home, that really, you know, kind of shows you how, you know, First Nations patients are treated, like to have to leave uh, their homes and, you know, be told to stay in a hotel room where, you know, even the food, the quality of the food is not appropriate with what the dietitian tells you. The report states early death rates are three times higher for First Nation people. George Lammers has been on dialysis for nine years. The 52-year-old had to have part of his leg amputated due to diabetes complications. The health care system isn't what you think it is. You think you're going to go and stay in a hospital and be treated with respect. But meanwhile, the nurses are too busy handing out medications to people and Lammer says he's experienced subpar treatment. I call it subtle racism. They don't actually say it to you, but it's by the way how their actions are, how they talk to you. It's like uh, very degrading. 
For Tate, she would like to see a health care system run by First Nations. Having adequate primary health care services in our community, run by our community and actually developed by our community, and then infusing dollars to have you know our um, our own people go into the health professional, whether it be nurse, whether it be a doctor. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. We want to hear what you think. Here's how you can continue the conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca. You can find us online at aptnnews.ca and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also follow APTN News on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more Indigenous news. An elder in the small town of Grimshaw, Alberta, has been living in a cold, drafty house for seven years. She's reached out to her band and governments for assistance, and she has found no help. APTN's Chris Stewart has that story. Yvonne Anderson has lived in this house since 1995. Yeah, to look at it from a distance, it looks nice and cozy. And it used to be. But Yvonne says for the past seven years, this house has become cold. You can put your fingers under the front door. The windows are the originals from when it was built in the 1940s or early 50s. For Yvonne, at 76 years old, keeping her home warm is an impossible task. I have to use blankets on the doors, both doors. And uh, if I have to use a blanket in my bedroom, I will use it because it's cold. The floor is cold like this morning. The floors are cold. It's still September in northern Alberta. It will get much colder. Yvonne's longtime friend, Dave Bannock, is a contractor. He says it will take $10,000 to replace the windows, widen and replace the doors to bring the house up to code, and allow Yvonne to live comfortably once more. The picture windows have the seals broken. The trims on them are as old as the house, probably in the late 40s, early 50s. And uh, the windows in the bedrooms are aluminum sliders, about as cold as you can get any window to be and still have a window. The problem is she can't afford $10,000 living by herself. The mother and grandmother says her family is not in a financial position to help her. But I have no extra money at all. Like, you know, I don't have extra money. You're living on a pension? Although I'm in a pension, yeah. But, you know, I got to pay for this. My house, my truck insurance and all that and food and, you know, lights, gas, water. You will have to pay for all that. By the time you finish paying all that, what do you have? Not very much. Anderson has written letters to the Alberta government and the federal government. The Alberta government informed her of a seniors program that gives loans to fix houses, but the interest rate is almost 4%, and she does not want a lien on her house. Indigenous Services Canada say that they are responding to this individual by private correspondence. Yvonne has told APTN she has not received any correspondence as of airtime. Yvonne is from the Deneta First Nation. She says she has personally asked leadership there for help. She says she was told that since she lives off reserve, there is nothing that can be done. She believes the band should help their people no matter where they live. This is why I'm asking if I can get the help from my reserve because they counted us when they go through the government. Our heads are counted for. And I want to know where the money is, and, and I feel like um, this is discrimination, what they're doing to us. Not, on to, not only me, but for everybody. Phone calls and emails by APTN to Chief James Anasay have not been returned as of airtime. Dave Bannock says that unfortunately, Yvonne is not alone, living in unacceptable conditions. It's time that somebody steps up to the plate and realizes this is a national problem, not just Yvonne's not just the town of Grimshaw, not just the, uh, the uh, MDs, it is right across the province and right across the country. And Yvonne Anderson wants and hopes for someone to help her, as each day slowly gets colder. Winter is coming. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Grimshaw, Alberta. For the past three months, reporter Kenneth Jackson has been investigating Ontario's child welfare system. 
and the shocking number of Indigenous children dying. We'll have that story for you tomorrow, but here's a quick glimpse into what he's uncovered. Every three days, a child connected to care dies. It was somewhere around nine in the morning, and uh, all he said was, the baby turned blue. We're on our way to the hospital. Nothing the government can do can make up for the wrongs it consciously perpetrated against kids. And I want to emphasize that. It was conscious. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't an accident. Again, we'll have that story for you tomorrow. Coming up in, later in the show, we'll sit down with the leader of the federal NDP, Jagmeet Singh. Hear why Indigenous people should vote for his party. But first, here's a look at Wednesday's weather forecast. Starting off on the east coast, we got 15 in rain in Fredericton, 11 in rain in St. John's. Happy Valley Goose Bay is sunny and 14 degrees. Kujuak, 15 in sunshine. Ruin Nuranda, 16 degrees. Same with Val Dora, rain there. 24 in sunny in Ottawa, 18 in rain in Sault Ste. Marie. 13 in rain in Sioux Lookout, Capus Casing and Timmins, cloudy and 18 degrees. 5 in rain up in Churchill, 12 in rainy in Norway House. 16 in sunshine for Dauphin, Gimli, and Winnipeg. 17 in sunny in Swift Current, 16 in sunshine in Yorkton. 8 for Stony Rapids in Uranium City, 11 and rain in Buffalo Narrows. Welcome back. APTN News has been inviting all of the federal party leaders to sit down to discuss their party's priorities that are of interest to Indigenous peoples. So far we've heard from Maxine Bernier, leader of the People's Party, and Green Party leader Elizabeth May. Today we're joined by the leader of the federal NDP, Jagmeet Singh. Mr. Singh, thanks for joining us. Uh, you've announced that an NDP government would give veto power to provinces over national infrastructure projects, including pipelines. Would that veto extend to First Nations? Uh, that's not what I've said. And uh, those words have actually never came out of my mouth. What, what I've said very clearly is we've got to do things differently. And that means not imposing pipelines on provinces. And really, it means working with communities and absolutely means working with indigenous communities. We've seen that the past approach of liberal and conservative governments has been disrespectful and hasn't worked. And what we need to do is have a collaborative approach, one that's based on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We need to move forward in a way that actually is collaborative, that actually respects and works with people so that we can solve problems and we can move ahead with projects. So that was uh, misreported, I guess, the uh, veto to provinces? Absolutely. It was something that I've never said. Uh, and I said very clearly that uh, my approach is to do things differently. We've got a, a series of powers that exist, but the way those powers have been used have not achieved the results. So instead of continuing down the same path and trying to do things the same way, let's do things differently. And our approach is that we've got to actually have serious conversations, work collaboratively collaboratively with people. Uh, make sure that Indigenous communities are respected, given dignity, and are worked, as, worked with as partners, not as imposing and forcing things. That's a different way that we're proposing. You're committed to implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 Calls to Action, and the National Enquiry's Calls for Justice, uh, all things, of course, promised by the Liberals as well. Uh, why should Indigenous peoples trust an NDP government would move on these items? Well, I mean, you're, you're right to bring up the, the Trudeau and Liberal government's uh, track record has been abysmal. They've said a lot of nice things, but they've had empty promises and, and broken faith, and it's been completely unacceptable. It's been wrong what they've done. Uh, I believe that f to build, a, to build a, a country where we move forward and tackle the problems that we're faced with, we have to do it in a different way. And it's got to involve honestly working towards reconciliation, not just talking about it, but actually implementing. That's why we're committing not to vague promises, but very clear and distinct things. We're saying we need to respect Indigenous communities, and that means implementing the Declaration. We've got to We've got to challenge the status quo and say the past has not worked. It's meant that many people have been given a raw deal, an unfair 
uh, shot at life, and we've got to change that. And that's why we're committed to cleaning drinking water, making sure there's equal access to education, not taking Indigenous kids to court to challenge whether or not they have the right to have equal funding. We believe fundamentally, at a minimum, Indigenous kids have, rights, have the right to equal funding and more. We've got to go beyond that, making sure that we undo the injustices of the past and the ongoing injustices of the present. Another big issue is the climate crisis. Uh, you say you have a, a plan to involve Indigenous peoples in a, a more effective way? Well, we know that there is uh, so much wisdom that Indigenous communities have. They are stewards of the land. They're folks that are so deeply connected as a way of life, as a way of existence with the land. And it makes no sense that Indigenous communities aren't being involved as partners to solving the crisis of climate, the climate crisis. And, and we want to change that. We want to make sure that Indigenous communities are uh, equal partners, are, are part of the solution. Their wisdom, their experience, their knowledge is something that is, that is utilized and is, is a part of what we're doing as a country moving forward. You've proposed a number of items that uh, have gained some popularity, but the polls don't seem to be reflecting that. Uh, how do you plan to increase uh, your popularity among voters in the coming weeks? Well, we're putting it to Canadians that there's a choice in this election. You've got liberals that say nice things and, and break those commitments, and you've got conservatives that are going to cut services for you. But both of them, at the end of the day, they work the people at the very top. They make corporations and the wealthier, the wealthiest and the most privileged classes wealthier and they make their lives easier, but it makes life harder for everyone else. I don't work for the rich. I don't work for the people at the top. I work for people. I work for indigenous communities and I work for uh, people across this country who are struggling. I want to work to build a better future, which means putting in place real policies like pharmacare for everyone dental care so that people can have access to the dental health that they need, making sure that we build a quality, affordable housing, making sure we chart a positive and, and, and a beautiful path forward. That is possible. That is something we can do. I'm really excited about that path forward, and I'm confident that Canadians will, will join us on this journey together. You've uh, attracted a number of Indigenous candidates this time around. Uh, what's behind that? Were they stepping up, or were you actively searching for candidates? Uh, I'm really honored that uh, Indigenous leaders and, and community activists have chosen to, to join our party, to join our movement. And, and to me, it's uh, a couple of things. One, I really believe that our candidates and our uh, federal government elected officials should reflect the people of Canada. And the fact that the first people of this land have not been in included and involved uh, has been a, a shortcoming, has been something that's been wrong. And, and I wanted to change that by making it an effort, making it a, a particular emphasis to make sure we recruit as many people as possible that respect and reflect this country, uh, reflect this country, sorry. And that's why for me it was really important to recruit as many Indigenous community members as possible. Uh, we wanted to make sure women were represented. And so we've worked really hard to make sure we've got a record number of women that are that are presenting as candidates as well. And we've also got a, a lot of racialized communities that are involved. For me, it's very important, and I'm really honored to have particularly the, uh, the number of Indigenous uh, leaders and champions that are, that are a part of our team. We're nearing a, a record number of Indigenous candidates running across all party lines this time around. Why aren't we hearing more about Indigenous issues in this election? I think we need to. I think it's a very important, um, a very important uh, part of our, our history that we've got to acknowledge that there's been massive injustice and we've got to be committed to a brighter path forward and that's what we're, we're going to do. Uh, we've got a series of commitments that will help us move forward in a way that's going to undo that injustice. Uh, I've made a number of commitments around the fact that I wouldn't take Indigenous communities to court when the Human Rights Tribunal has ruled very clearly on things like equal funding. And, and I believe that there's certain things that we should do right away. Clean drinking water, access to education, access to quality housing, uh, healthcare access, these are things we should do right away. And there's a lot of uh, positive things we can do if we work together, and I'm confident we can do it. Mr. Singh, we'll have to leave it there. Appreciate you taking some time for us. Thanks so much. Coming up, a 13,000 year old discovery. But first, here's a look at the rest of Wednesday's weather forecast. To Northern Alberta, we got 13 rain in Grand Prairie, 11 in rainy in Fort McMurray, 18 in Sunshine and Medicine Hat, 17 in Sunny and Lethbridge, 16 in rain in Bella Coola, 19 in Sunny in Kamloops, 17s for Victoria and Vancouver. 
Rain in Dees Lake, 8 degrees. Smithers is rainy and 11 tomorrow. 8 for Dawson City and Mayo and Beaver Creek, rain in the, that area. 10 in Sunshine in Norman Wells, rain in Wati and 7 degrees. Inuvik is 6 and so is Fort McPherson, mix of sun and cloud. Minus 4 in Cambridge Bay, 1 in rain in Baker Lake, 9 in Whale Cove and Arviat. Pemberton is going to be cloudy in 9 degrees. A glue look is going to have a little bit of snow in 4 degrees. Welcome back. An archaeology team in Haida Gwaii has discovered a site that might have been occupied 13,000 years ago. That means that people could have been living there 2,000 years earlier than previously believed. APTN's Lee Wilson reports. Haida Gwaii means islands of the Haida people. Located off of British Columbia's north coast, now a scientific team may have found a historic piece of the puzzle, which tells how and when the first people inhabited North America. We identified uh, pollen and spores and charcoal from a, a sediment core in a, in a small pond that was um, once fresh water and has now been covered over by rising sea levels. Discovery of charcoal points to fire for heating and cooking. The archaeology team dug deeper and found samples. Point back 13,000 years ago, 2,000 years before records of proven occupation. Well, why is there so much charcoal here? Because we're in a hyper maritime, very wet uh, coastal climate where uh, forest fires are, are very rare or almost non existent in some areas. And analyzed, counted the charcoal bits in there and discovered that there were many peaks of charcoal that were statistically significant below the period of known occupation. One major implication of the findings is that people here were already using marine vehicles, hunting and fishing, more than 13,000 years ago. And the archaeological evidence of animals that were hunted and used include marine fish like halibut and uh, salmon and, hair and others, Plus, some, what really surprised me, there were bones of albatross in here. Another implication challenges a scientifically accepted view that inhabitants first came through the Bering Strait on an ice-free corridor in the interior, then moved to the coast. It now looks like it's the other way around. People were came down using watercraft, knowing how to use marine resources. And that is a, a major um, sort of change in thinking from a land-based to a marine, from marine to probably more land-based. Uh. With other recent discoveries in North America that go back up to 16,000 years ago, beliefs are shifting that people were on the coast much earlier than we thought. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Northern British Columbia. Can't get an ugly story out of there. No, that's a beautiful territory <laughs> there. Well, that's your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For much more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. That's where you'll find more on the political showdown in Métis Nation and the latest on a new report on how to improve child and family services in B.C. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Thanks for tuning in. And I'm Dennis Ford. Have a great night. See you back here tomorrow.